What's up, everyone? Mute yourself. And off we go. There you go, Chris. got some great people tuning in greg jason jules carrie hello everyone Lori, lisa matthew hello hello thanks everyone for tuning in on a saturday should we wait a minute for some stragglers we'll 60 seconds we'll wait 60 seconds well, you know, in music education, if you if you are on time, you're actually right. That's oh, well, I was rule. actually going to say, being that this is a music <laughs> thing, if you're on time, you're you're way too early. That's music industry, not music. That's music education. industry, not music. <laughs> this is, we take this. We take music education very seriously. Ask Big everyone difference. of the teachers on here. That day. Big difference. <laughs> yes. Music industry. Yeah, that's they're early right now. <laughs> yeah. No, this is great. Yeah. You know, the music teachers are showing. I, was just, I can time. play some music while we wait. You know, get on the keys a little bit. We'll you absolutely Chris. should, Graham. We have yeah, Graham. Entertain us. Oh, sure. Why not? Show your skills. Throw some last of the Mohicans in there. <laughs> oh, my God. Last of the Mohicans. It's like he does this professionally. This, ooh. Graham Winder, the founder of Keys and Kingdoms, <laughs> serenading us on this Saturday morning. Look, look at this. I think we should dive in. Should we dive into this? Let's Graham, dive in. let's dive in. Let's go. So, this is going to be a really great hour on a Saturday. We're super excited that everyone's tuning in, and we really appreciate it. We've got a great panel, a great guest of panelists here, talk about music tech, music education, the future of it, everything. This could be really exciting. I'm really excited that Brian is here because I am that kid whose life was changed by Guitar Hero. I waited in line at Best Buy. It's the only time I ever waited in line for a video game was to get Guitar Hero. Guitar Hero totally changed my life. It inspired me to pick up a guitar. It changed the music I listened to, which changed the friends I listened, the friends I hung out with. It changed the people. I, it changed the way I dressed. It changed my hair. I grew my hair out. I didn't kiss a girl until I cut my hair. So in a way, Guitar Hero <laughs> stunted my sexual development. But that's for another webinar. Brian, what was the process here? Because you and I were talking the other day. This was not supposed to teach people music, but this was supposed to inspire people and give them the feeling of playing music and get them excited to tap into something that they were probably never going to experience because learning an instrument is so freaking hard. What was this like putting this game together? What was the goal? How did Guitar Hero come together? Can you give us a little background on it? Yeah, of course. First of all, Zach, I, I had no idea that it had an impact on anybody as much as it did yourself. So, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. We'll talk later about uh, about some of those elements. Uh, some of it was actually uh, planned. Others that you just mentioned, maybe not so much. Um, uh, Guitar Hero uh, it was it has an interesting story. Um, uh, you know, prior to that, you know, video games. This is sort of now we kind of wheel back to the early 2000s. Um, you know, ancient history for uh, interactive entertainment and technology, but uh, back to the early 2000s. And, you know, back then, video games were largely a solitudinal uh, activity, right? People bought a, bought a disc, uh, stuck it into their, um, into their PlayStation or their Xbox, and off they went. They played through it, and they, uh, they played alone, right? It wasn't a multiplayer type experience. Um, and, uh, and so because it was solitudinal, our, our thinking was um, a few things. Number one, in the music industry, um, you know, we saw a lot of changes during that time frame where, 
you know, artists were really struggling. I mean, they, were, they weren't getting paid well for their music. They, they had a hard time amplifying to other demographics and bring, bring in uh, different generations into, uh, let's say, classic rock or other music. And uh, it seemed like a very good time for us to take a look at um, a game that would bring families together, um, a game that would, uh, you know, be multiplayer and be able to have, you know, lots of interaction, be super social. It was also about the time when Nintendo was coming out with uh, the Wii and the Wii Fit, et cetera, which is sort of, you know, dragging the video game uh, industry out of the basement of that solitude of gameplay into the living room or the family room or the great room or there or the media room. And so, um, you know, my, my boss uh, said, look, you're, you're into, you're into music. Um, you know, you seem like a, a guy that, that it'll take, can take the home of this thing. Go to Japan. There's a game there we looked at. We're not sure about what to do with it. it it's uh, called Guitar Freaks and small little group of guys sitting in Tokyo that developed this thing and they don't, they, they don't know what to do with it, but they're, I think we can buy it. Went there and uh, uh, made a phone call and said, look, I want to, I want to buy this franchise. So I wrote a check and tucked it under my wing and, and came back to the U S and started working on how we can sort of do what we were describing around you know, enrolling, um, enrolling musicians and enrolling, um, you know, uh, uh, agents and artists into um, this ecosystem to try to, Claw in, you know, a different generation and, and amplify um, great rock and roll at the time. It's kind of when we started to do classic rock. So we started out with, with Guitar Hero One. Um, it was it, it was okay. Uh, it did okay here in the U.S. It, it we tried to launch it in other markets. It really didn't uh, do well. And so a diagnostic went underway to figure out why it didn't do well in other markets. And and uh, go figure, Motley Crue's not uh, not necessarily uh, uh, you know a, a popular uh, band in uh, I don't know uh, Eastern Europe. So. Um, so, so we started to sort of tailor it to, you know, the various geographies. Um, and what it, what it did amazingly was it sort of made Guitar Hero um, the country's own, you know, it was five songs from, from Spain, five songs from Italy, five songs from the UK, five songs from, from France. And so, um, so, and we took, put a sleeve on it, they kind of made it look like it was supposed to be, you know, hey, this is your Guitar Hero for your country with local, uh, with local artists. Um, so what it did was it, 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 you know, brought families together. It did exactly, Zach, as you described, um, uh, it, you know, it kind of that play pattern of, you know, when we're brought up as kids, especially boys, we're taking that broom handle and, and doing one of these and playing that broom handle sort of took that play pattern um, into actually engaging in music. So all of a sudden artists are like, wait a minute, you know, I'm not only getting, you know, a different generation listening to my music, but I'm getting a different generation engaging in my music. So, um, you know, as you can imagine, that started getting momentum. And then, you know, we were, my wife and I were out of concerts a lot anyway. And so a lot of the artists that are very, very popular would be sitting side stage and talking to them before they went out. And, you know, it happened time and time again where they would say, look out in the audience. Like, you've been to a thousand of our concerts. Like, look what you're seeing out there. You're seeing parents with, with their children out there. So, um, you know, comments like uh, in their websites or to me of, um, you just gave, us another 10 years of touring because you know these different generations are now very interested in our music and engaging in our music um and of course there was a monetary piece to it as well where we were paying them actually a fair amount of money especially for the top songs played on guitar hero so we went through all of that turned that business from a you know nothing really a five guy operation called guitar breaks changed the name to guitar hero went global uh tailored it to the different markets and and turned uh you know a, a very small idea uh, into a $1.4 billion sort of cultural uh, juggernaut. Um, so that was, uh, that was the, the story behind it. Um, I, I tell you that um, just a, a bit of a commercial break for Graham and, and his team. Um, when Graham came to me and said, look, we got this music learning game, you know, it was sort of like penny dropped immediately for me because one of the things we didn't do and it was never intended to do was to actually teach music. It was to engage in music. It was to broaden uh, audiences and to monetize. Um, and so, you know, this was a really cool idea and like, wow, this is great. So, so actually it's gaming for good. It's, it's, it's turning that play pattern and that idea into something that can be translated into real learning experience. And I believe for a very long time that, uh, that gaming and that play pattern, that engagement and that, and, and, and just that, that attention that especially younger people have today can be turned into real learning experiences. This is where kids and young people reside. So, you know, to give them content that actually helps them to learn stuff versus a, let's call it a first person shooter, which I'm very familiar with by Call of Duty, um, which is more of a, a, an entertainment and a, and a social um, aspect to it. This is something that actually, you know, parents can come home, or kids can go home to their parents and parents can engage with them and, 
and they can actually learn something. Um, it's not just music. It can be, I think, applied. This play pattern and this uh, uh, this this way of way of uh, learning can be applied to many many uh, subjects. Graham, we we can toss to you. One of the cool things about Keys and Kingdoms is that it actually learns how you learn, and it sends you content and games to hit how you learn, and it figures this out pretty quickly. And this, I think, reflects your journey learning music, where I think you know you're pretty open about how it was kind of a struggle for you early on in your education environment. Can you talk a little bit about that and about how that inspired the development of Keys and Kingdoms? Yeah, absolutely. When you say struggle, I mean failing. I was failing all my classes, and uh, and I loved everything about music as a kid. So it was very confusing to me how I'm not thriving in this subject that I love so much. And that was very confusing, even to the university level. I mean, I, I kept battling, kept trying, and it just I could never. I was always that square peg in a round system, and it wasn't until much later that we realized, you know, there's these different modalities of obtaining musical information that are just not fully developed in today's curriculum or today's pedagogy, and so that was kind of where it all started, you know, for us is, like, can we build something that can engage these different modalities of learning? Um, so we really kind of widen, you know, the spectrum of learners and really uh, can hit on a lot of different type learning types, and I know teachers like myself, I mean, we all know that, you know, our students all learn very differently at times. And, you know, they, they get a lot of different, uh, you know, cues from how we teach. Some they accept very readily and some not so much. It's a struggle for them. So that's kind of where the premise from Keys and Kingdoms really came from was just, <coughs> I, just the confusion I had as a kid going, man, I love everything about music. I can play things I hear. I can sit down and tinker and come up with stuff. But I really struggle visually. I struggle with the notes. I struggle with uh, keeping my focus on a page, you know, especially if it's a couple pages long. So, um, so that was uh, the struggle. Then we uh, decided to, to open up my wife and I opened up a school and just try some new concepts and some new approaches. And we were floored by what we saw. And these kids were doing things that, you know, leading more into the, the realm of fluency. And fluency <coughs> for a musician looks like, you know, as soon as they hear the music, they, they know what it is instantly. They don't have to practice it. They don't have to find it. They just know what it is, just like everyone understands the English language. So that was, you know, the big goal here. Can we, can we get, teach students to get fluency and to get it rather quickly and not be like a 10-plus year journey? Um, and turns out, absolutely, we can. And we saw some of these kids getting there in three, four years. You know, then they could literally play anything they heard. And we're like, wow. And then... Think about how that opens up the world of creativity. You know, if you understand how a song is constructed, then you can reconstruct it in your own style, in your own way. And now you've got creativity wrapped up into the learning process, which <coughs> is so powerful. So that's kind of where Keys and Kingdoms came from. And of course, what Brian mentioned, we were so lucky to cross paths with him because, you know, his expertise in this particular area was is just, it continues to be to this day so critical to to our progress and our success moving forward. So, um, yeah. Graham, what were some of the elements that you had to bake in in order to make the game engaging and fun? I know uh, some members of the Guitar Hero team were looking at an early game like Parappa the Rappa, which was this very simple game, but was goal-oriented and was really fun to play. That was sort of an early thing with you that this has to first be a fun game primarily, and then we're gonna bake in this music education stuff what was that process like to create the engaging game and then bake in the education stuff on top? Yeah, I learned that the hard way. And I, I learned that through a failed first startup. <laughs> I learned that, you know, we have to start with a really fun game. We have to be engaging to these kids. It's got to be fun. And the first program we built was really more on the ed tech side. It was very educational, you know, educationally oriented. And, you know, kids would rather go home and play Minecraft, Roblox, Fortnite. And, you know, we had a little quiz game that they it was just like, no. So we knew that was not the right um, approach. The other key piece of our development was we can't build a game that is a one-size-fits-all. So I think that was your earlier question. So we had to build something that had adaptive learning in it. And what that means is that the algorithms of this game, Keys and Kingdoms, assesses the success and failure rates in six different developmental verticals. And what that really comes that boils down to is that it's a personalized experience that moves at your pace. So it keeps the students in like a you know, 70 to 80% success funnel, which makes you feel like you're doing well and, and, and moving forward, but also has a little bit of challenge there too to make sure you're still learning. 
Yeah, totally makes sense. Beth, this is something that you came across and been such an advocate for, you know, the the motto, the mantra for give a note is where you live shouldn't determine what you learn. How does a game like this play into it? Or what have you seen as you've been, you know, hanging out with the Keys in the Kingdoms crew and just getting into this world of music tech, music education? Yeah, sure. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And that's a, that's a great question. So, uh, so Zach, I met Graham a little over a year ago, uh, was introduced to us. Um, and, you know, just from, from the get go, just loved the story of where he came from, you know, and his, his uh, inability to learn um, from a visual standpoint, and his great success from an audio standpoint, audible standpoint. And you know the my apologies for the dog barking in the background. <laughs> you can't have a webinar without somebody having a dog, right? We checked that. If you had that on your bingo <laughs> card, you might have bingo. Is the uh... <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, uh, you know, just uh, you know, the, the children do learn differently, and you know, Give a Note is very focused on innovation. Um, our mission is to nurture, grow, and strengthen music education opportunities for all children. So we're always looking for new and innovative ideas that can be brought into the classroom, um, either by educators or by people from the outside the world that are, are wanting to support education, music education. So that's where Graham and I are so very, very aligned. Um, you know, he said from day one that, you know, he wanted to support the music educator. You know, it's a consumer brand that also expands into the educational market very, very well. And, you know, we've got some teachers on here today that are going to talk to talk to us about that experience. And I think that's going to be very important because, um, you know, education is changing. COVID changed uh, how many teachers had to teach. Um, and hello to a lot of these people I'm seeing on this call. I, I've had personal conversations with you about your teaching and what you do and, and how you survived through COVID. And, you know, technology was a big part of what teachers had to transition to. Um, and having things like the gaming industry and like Kings and Kings and Kingdoms that can be music, musical learning um, to assist you through those times uh, was, was a very important aspect of that. So uh, we support that 100%. Totally makes sense. Let's jump actually to Jason, I believe Marcus, you guys have actually used this game in the classroom right? What's the experience been like? Is it as fun as we say it is? Are kids into it? What's the, how, are, how, how do kids respond to it? Yeah, my kids are loving it. Sorry, the, the Zoom kicked me off the video, but uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Loud and clear. I just made you the host. So you coming? might be able to okay, great. bring video back. There we go. Sorry about that. I don't know why my phone did that. Um, uh, my kids have been a absolutely uh, uh, loving it. Uh, let me make the post again. Sorry. There we go. Okay. Uh, they have been loving it. It's been very hard to get kids motivated about learning, especially this year and last year because of COVID and because of the remote learning. And having this in the classroom for them and something that they can actually look forward to playing like it's it, it's almost like it's not school but they are learning from it is a real ally oh my god we lost him <laughs> marcus we're gonna jump to you <laughs> Uh, happy. What? So, uh, uh, like, like he was saying, um, you know, with, with my class, I teach two different periods of just, uh, keyboard and, you know, sort of like Graham, I would say between 40 to 60%, depending on the class period, my kids hate learning how to read sheet music, like it's poison. So having this, uh, you know, this alternative to it that still develops their technique and all that kind of stuff is, uh, you know, game changing because everyone who was teaching music during the pandemic probably became pretty um, acquainted with Quaver music. Um, I was teaching elementary, so I was using it a lot. And, you know, not to disparage Quaver in any way, it's an unbelievable resource. I love using it. But kids today are, are a little bit too smart. So they kind of start to see the, you know, the age and the game of the gamification, like they, they see that it's just regular homework behind this more fun kind of thing, especially as they start to get into fifth grade and middle school. Um, and, you know, it kind of got a little bit difficult. So when I presented this to my kids, uh, you know, they couldn't believe that this was actually, you know, 
it looks like a real video game and it is a real video game. It's not like, you know, one of those flash things that's just, you know, flash cards with fancy little animations or anything like that. It's a real, you know, RPG kind of like the stuff that they would play at home. Uh, and, you know, with, with me, with a couple of my classes, I have more students than I have keyboards. So what I have is, you know, five students a day, we rotate, we'll play Keys and Kingdoms on the side. And, you know, they're super, super into it. And I was telling, uh, I want to say like almost two weeks ago, I was talking with Graham and my, the school that I work at is enormous. It's a, it's a K through eight center. And we have like 2,200 kids in it or something like that. Um, and that means that we have an unbelievably diverse group of kids. And in both of my keyboard classes, I have a couple of students who are, you know, um, on the autism spectrum and I have my, you know, separate lesson plans for them and all that kind of stuff for when they're actually on the keyboard. But I had this one student that I was, you know, struggling with because they were very uh, anxious. So when I would come up and try to approach them on the keyboard to try to teach them something, you know, I could see her hand shaking and she wouldn't want to speak to me um, because, you know, I just started working there. The last teacher was there for 13 years. So, um, you know, she was very, very nervous. So when I was finally able to get this into her hands, I was able to, you know, set her up at her desk, give her the little MIDI keyboard that, uh, that we were given by Graham. And within a week, I was telling him that uh, the, one of the best things about Keys and Kingdoms, because it's, it's very risky to just give kids a device and say, you know, play this game because they, they have Snapchat and Instagram and all this stuff on their phone, is that Keys and Kingdoms will send you a report card based on how much the kids have been doing. And I have kind of like a little competition to see who gets the farthest and all this kind of stuff. And this student is very, very quiet. You know, she's very shy. And when the report cards came in, she, she had like almost triple the score and the progress that these other students had made. And when I brought that up to everyone, you know, she was, she was so happy. She was, you know, starting to open up a little bit more. She was a little bit more comfortable talking with me, a little bit more comfortable, you know, interacting with the class. So just having this, you know, this, this separate thing on the side that isn't, uh, it's not like a, 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 a prize or something that means you just get to be outside of the classroom and just have fun and not learn. It is fun and they are still part of the classroom, but they're also learning, you know, just as much as if they're, you know, practicing sight read or not sight reading, but, you know, reading the Mozart sonata or whatever we're working on in class. So it's, you know, especially for me, I just recently started working at the school. It's been an invaluable resource and it's, you know, it just made, it makes your life so much easier and, and it's not hindering the kids uh, education in any way. I mean, I feel like when I look at, you know, I definitely had a couple music teachers who made me cry in my musical career, me too. Learning, some, <laughs> learning some of these concepts, modes, how to harmonize a major scale. These are things that are so uh, abstract and so hard to grasp. And you're very vulnerable as you're learning these concepts. And when you learn in a game like this, it's a personal setting where, you know, there's no shame. You don't have to worry about being embarrassed because it's a personal experience. There's no one around you. Marcus, are you kind of experiencing this? Are kids able to go into this world, into this very safe space, not feel embarrassed when they get stuff wrong and just be very, it's a very personal experience learning in an environment like this, no, no, right? A, a, a thousand percent. I mean, the first thing that they do is they get to customize their little character to make, you know, they can make it look like them. They can make it look like a completely different person. So that are, that all automatically gives them some kind of, you know, foot in this world, if you want to call it that. But the, the way that the difficulty sort of, you know, fluctuates based on how well or how, you know, how much the, the student is struggling makes it so that there's always a, a fairly consistent, uh, you know, challenge gradient. Because if, you know, kind of like what Graham said, if you're staring at a multi-page piece of music, it can feel like you're plateauing and not making any progress because all of that incremental progress is, you know, you're there doing it yourself. So you don't really feel that kind of like how, you know, when little kids grow up and they go to visit their grandparents and they say like, oh, you've grown so much. And they always say, no, I know I have. And I look the same because they look at themselves in the mirror every day and they don't see that, you know, step-by-step -step improvement. So this game kind of does the same thing that, you know, when you, when you're, when you hand a kid a piece of music by someone like Mozart or Beethoven, there's all of this stigma behind them that like, oh, this is going to be difficult. This is going to be this or that. If it's a video game, it just gives them a piece of music and says, you know, try it. And they don't have that kind of, uh, you know, anxiety before they approach the piece. It's just, a, you know, a game to them. So they're more uh, like, like willing to make those mistakes and they don't feel embarrassed to make those mistakes because, you know, I'm sure when they're at home, you know, playing what, like Graham said, Minecraft or Call of Duty or whatever, I'm sure they don't feel embarrassed when they lose. So it's, it's kind of, you know, turning it like changing the way that their brain works in that same kind of way. 
Absolutely. So by the way, this is supposed to be super interactive. So if you're tuning in at the bottom of your screen, there should be a Q&A section. And if you have any questions that you want to ask anyone, we're going to do a Q&A at the end, or if you just blurt something out in the text, we might just get to it and just get, get a question answered. Graham, I want to toss this to you because aren't kids spending a little too much time on video games? And now they're going to spend more time on video games because they're going to be learning music. What's, what's the thought process here? Do we want our kids playing video games, more video games than they already are? No, and I'm failing as a parent in that category with my own kids. But, you know, we try to limit the time. But um, we realize that we've got to meet these kids where they're at today. And where they're at today is they're on devices, they're on platforms, they're on media, TV, movies. I mean, parents are, are just trying to keep their heads above water, you know, working and trying to manage working at home and managing kids at home. So, um, <clears throat> you know, when we, when we built this thing, we're like, well, we know that, uh, and, the, and the, Brian can actually speak to this really well with the gaming industry, but we know that kids, the gaming industry is booming and it's, it's really uh, reaching into lower and younger ages and age groups. And so we said, well, we already saw this with our first startup where we just built ed tech software and it wasn't engaging and it wasn't uh, capturing, you know, the young minds that we were hoping to. And so when we went back to the drawing table, it was a pretty obvious, you know what? We build, we'll build a video game, but this is one that parents can feel good about screen time. Parents can feel, and teachers as well, can feel good about this screen time because <clears throat> they know that it's educational and they know that the kids will walk away with, you know, real musical skills and abilities. And so that I feel much better about than say if my kid was playing, you know, uh, just an entertainment game for an hour. I know he's walking away from that feeling entertained, but really not taking any into real life skills. And so we thought, you know, this is really the way to do it. We got to get, capture their attention, bring them in, but then have them leave the game with real uh, musical skills. And Graham, when I was learning music, I feel like, of course, learning to read music was hard, but the expectation was, if you want to be a real musician, you have to learn how to read music. And if you can't learn from that pedigree, you have no business even picking up a guitar here I am in Nashville where most of the top session players have no idea how to read a note of music and they're the best players in the world and make more money than the average player as well. But like, do kids, should kids be learning music? Even if it's a struggle, isn't that kind of how you become a proficient musician? Like I really struggled to learn how to read music and I kind of got there, but you know, I don't know at what cost I've been learning how to improvise better. I mean, what, what do you think? I mean, that, that is a big question. And, what I, the way I look at sight reading is I look at it as a really valuable skill to have as a musician. Um, and we do teach that in our school as well. And it's one of the modalities. So to ignore it, I think is a mistake, but to keep it as your core competency and everything funnels through a visual, you know, paradigm, I think is also limiting. And so you've got to kind of open up the different modalities. And so the three for music learning is, you know, visual, aural, and creative. And so you got to make sure that you're, you're able to touch on all of those different pathways, I think, to make the most optimal musician. Now, that being said, we all have our own strengths and weaknesses. I was a horrible visual learner, um, and, but I had real good strengths in my aural and, and creative modalities. And I think that when you look at some of the most successful uh, musicians out there, why do they not read? I think part of that is that the visual kind of suppresses creativity a little bit because now – if all the information's on the page, you just have to execute instructions on the page. You don't have to contribute creatively to that piece of music. And so that's, I think that's where we really need to broaden uh, our overall uh, traditional pedagogy and say, look, we got to start to really develop these other areas to really maximize, you know, the potential in these, in these students. Um, the most important piece of any, any learning process is that student because that student brings something unique and original to the table each and every time. You know, Zach, if, if I may, there, there's yeah. one thing I wanted to just bolt on to, to Graf's comment. I think it's, it's an important piece of this is that um, it, the, the, the algorithms and the game itself and the way uh, the youth are learning uh, to play music by ear um, is, is done in classroom, but it's also most importantly done at home. And, um, and, and in order for a parent to, uh, you know, to help, you know, and to be a part of this learning process, um, you know, if, if you as a student struggle to learn music by by reading a parent is going to have a lot more issue with that right because they don't have a structure so this is a way also for a parent to kind of 
have to have fun with it and be able to participate and help their child to learn at home. So when they come back to school, you know, they've, they've gone that much further because they've been playing the game. They've been learning without even knowing they're learning in the evening. Um, and the parent, of course, um, you know, we all know, uh, we've all had our stories about talking to parents who are, who are now settled with being uh, teachers. Um, and that's not what they signed up for, right? So, um, it, you know, this, this provides uh, an element of, of, you know, like you know, keep, you know, turning that parent into a hero, right? And, and, and uh, you know, I'll, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had discussions with parents saying, oh my God, I got to learn how to, how to do arithmetic again. I don't remember any of this stuff. Uh, but, you know, this is a way for them to actually participate in their child's uh, education um, and, uh, and, you know, in, a, in an art, um, which, which is very satisfying for the parent as well. We had this similar situation with a game called, he, he called uh, uh, Skylanders, where parents were feeling very badly about not giving, being able to give their children time in the evenings. Skylanders was a very quick in and quick out game, and parents came back time and time again saying, thank you so much for for, for bringing this game into my child's life. I mean, I can come and I can dose my kid in between doing dishes and laundry, feel good about it. My kid's feeling good about it. It doesn't take up a lot of my time. If something is approachable for me, I can do it. This is sort of the same thing, but it's even better to actually teach uh, you know, real, uh, real learning. Did you experience that with Guitar Hero where parents more content to have their kids play Guitar Hero and at least be in a musical environment than they were playing, you know, James Bond, Goldeneye or... Uh... Or Call of Duty, or any of a you know maybe a first-person shooter game. Well, you just you just mentioned two of my other games, uh, uh, Goldeneye and uh, and, uh, and Call of Duty. So I, I love all my children, Zach. So this is going to be a hard, hard one for me to answer. Um, uh, we did we did find, but but see, it was actually a learning from Guitar Hero, which parents were also playing back, saying this is so great. Like I now have my kid home, my teenage kid home on a Friday night, and he's got friends coming over, and now my house is the destination. I'm interfacing with them; they're having fun. I'm having fun because I'm teaching, you know, I'm teaching them about my music, the music that I grew up with. They're loving it. Now I can take them to a concert when they tour, all that. Um, the, 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 the issue that we had though was like, it's a fairly significant allocation of time that you needed to do that. So if you play through a level of, call, of, of uh, Guitar Hero, it's half an hour, 20 minutes, whatever it is, play through five songs and master them, et cetera. Whereas with Skylanders, so we took that learning and brought it over Skylanders and said, we need doses of 10 minutes, 15 minutes max. And, and that really helped out a lot. And you know what? What, what Graham and, and, and the developers have done with this, with this game slash learning tool is even less. I mean, you can actually go in, help, you know, go away, do something else, come back to, to your child. So it's much more in tune with the way people live, um, where, you know, you, you got to, you know, integrate uh, learning and helping your children and being, you know, a loving parent with your children um, and helping them along with their education. And you still got responsibilities because you're a working family and it's even more apparent now where much of what we do is, uh, is doing you know, what we're doing right now, which is from the house in a, in a, in a, um, you know, a sterile room like I'm sitting. Yeah, totally makes sense. I've got a great question here that, uh, that maybe for Beth or Graham to answer. One concern I have is the cost. I teach in a rural area. How did the teachers get subscriptions for their students? Is it in addition to their schools or did the school pick up the tab and I'd love to add, add, you know, how many game consoles do you think are appropriate for a classroom? Does one game, does one, two or three games work and the students can jump in and switch off? What do you think, Beth or Graham or whoever wants to jump in and take that? Well, I'll let Graham take that, but I, um, uh, Graham, you take that question first. <laughs> I got good news for all the teachers out there. This game is 100% free. <laughs> um, if you're uh, an educator anywhere in the U.S., um, you just sign up uh, uh, with our form, online form. You can get on our website at keysandkingdoms.com. Um, and we'll send you a, a free box here with a free MIDI controller and enterprise license. Um, the only time that there would be a cost involved is if we wanted to do a school-wide or district-wide deployment of the game. You know, then then there'd be a little bit of cost involved. But like what Beth was saying earlier, I'm I'm a teacher first and foremost. Um, I want to fully support all of my my fellow teachers and colleagues out there and give them something they can really use uh, that's really fun and effective in the classroom. Um, one thing to to that I actually am going to mention today uh, that we just had was the alignment of Keys and Kingdoms with the national standards from the National Coalition of Core Arts, and so. 
Um, we've been working really closely with Ann Fennell. She's the music programmer over at the San Diego uh, Unified District in California. And she's really helped us um, put together the crossover of Keys and Kingdoms with the national standards. And why that's so important for educators <coughs> is that now we can really justify uh, strongly the use of this game in the classroom. Whereas before, it could be, well, it's a fun game, but I really need to be teaching them all the time. Um, well, now this game can really supplement that. So um, the price of it, it's free. Uh, all you have to do is sign up on our form. And then if you need more additional resources, like let's say, to Zach's question, uh, station of four or five controllers, then we can get those at a wholesale cost, very inexpensive. And if, if there's absolutely zero budget for anything, we'll probably just step in with our nonprofits and cover that cost for you. So whatever your needs are in the classroom, we're just here to, to meet those needs. That includes uh, the box is free, question mark. That includes the box and everything essentially oh, yeah. in there. Or? In the box, yeah, this thing right here, you get um, this box comes with this 25 key MIDI controller. It comes with a USB cord for PC and Mac. It also comes with an iOS adapter for iOS, like iPad or iPhone. Um, and I think some of our teachers can speak to this too, but like the way that you deploy this in the classroom, it really depends on what you have available. Um, for the older kids, they've actually been using their phones. They download the game, use the teacher code, and they can play the game on their own devices if the classroom doesn't have it. Um, we are, we just kicked off um, production of a Chromebook web application of this game, which will be huge. I mean, Chromebook is, I want to say 80% of the EDU market. So um, once we get Chromebook, I think it'll be a lot easier to get this game, you know, you know, it's really uh, in a, a big scale because that's, that's really what we want to get to. We just want to give this into all the teachers' hands and let them uh, use it in the classroom and see, you know, see what happens. You also get uh, 50 student profiles. Uh, you can't see my video, but uh, <laughs> you also get 50 student profiles with your um, with your um, account. So um, teachers do. So just so you know. Matt wants clarification. So it can be implemented on Chromebook and you don't have to have a keyboard lab in order to make it work? Correct. So actually you can use a QWERTY keyboard to play the game. Uh, on the iOS devices, there's actually a virtual keyboard that pops up and you can just touch on the screen um, that does limit some of the effectiveness of the game obviously it's meant to teach piano and to teach real musical skills so um, if if the issue is you don't have enough midi controllers we're going to help you solve that problem even if it's giving you four to six keyboards you know make sure you have the right devices and again we have some tremendous nonprofit partners like give a note like Mo music movement um, who can uh, open up some grant money to help teachers in their classrooms, get them more resources to set these things up. Yeah, if I can speak to that part of it for a minute, you know, I think it's really important from the teacher perspective to recognize that, um, you know, the future of music education does lie in part with technology in the classroom. And, you know, um, the main goal of any teacher is to engage their students in music learning because we all know the benefits um, that are lifelong benefits that come from learning music when you're when you're young, starting when you're young. Uh, in, any kind of instrumental um, or vocal music experience um, builds your cognitive skills, etc. So, um, what I what I find so fascinating about the gaming technology and, and keys and kingdoms is that it, it, it's such an interactive way to engage students who might not have been involved in music before. You know, they, they were afraid of it, but they're not afraid of a game. And so by getting them into the game, then they learn that they do have some musical skills because every child has musical skills. We all have them. Um, and, you know, just the mere fact of learning rhythms and, and notes and, and, you know, building the ear training. So, um, I, you know, from an educational standpoint, I'm just 100% supportive of, you know, getting things into the classroom like this program um, that enable a teacher to broaden the experience for and, and be more inclusive to all children. If, yeah. if I could add something to, to what both Beth and Zach, you also kind of mentioned earlier, is when I was in college, you know, 90% of my income was gigging. And I worked with some incredible, incredible musicians. And for a lot of that time, I was, a, I was in a bluegrass band. And I would be lying if I said that nine out of 10 of those times, 
I was the only person who knew how to read sheet music because like you were mentioning the session musicians and, you know, asking why these people never learned how to read sheet music mm -hmm. is because they never, they never had to. And there's a lot of aspects of music education, especially that are super, super antiquated. Like, you know, for all of us who went through music school, like when's the last time you ever thought about figured bass or anything like that? Like you've probably never used it since then. So, you know, having this in the classroom, uh, in, engages the kids and lets them know that, you know, if you're taking an orchestra class or if you're taking a keyboard class, it doesn't just mean that you're learning classical music, you're learning actual skills that if this is something you want to do as a career will prepare you for it. But, you know, what I think is almost as, or as important, if not more so, is that music can be part of your life, regardless if you do it as a, as a career or even as a hobby, it can enrich your life in some way. And every single person has a creative or a musical you know, gene in their body. So the more ways that you can, uh, you know, have the kids, you know, express themselves, the more ways that they can interact with this stuff, the less barriers it seems that there are. Because, you know, the only musicians that they think about are the superstars who are playing sold out stadiums. And that's, that's not the reality of what, you know, the music industry or music, you know, is. So it, it's, it's definitely, you know, takes the kind of the edge off of a lot of that stuff. And markets ways yeah. to interact with other with other students. Your your very story about the little girl, you know, coming out of her shell, and you know, from finding success in this way with the game, it was it was her gateway. It was yeah. her gateway into music learning and into expressing herself, which is what we all want. And mu music and arts and everything like that, uh, it's it's something you know you can pay thousands and thousands of dollars for the best teacher in the world, but unless you're putting in the work, you're not going to get any better. So I have a lot of kids who struggle in other classes and who make trouble in other classes and stuff like that. Because especially in middle school, you know, you're teaching these kids history. How can you, you know, convince them that what they're doing is actually making them smarter, all of that kind of stuff. There's no immediate feedback. Whereas you put a kid in front of an instrument, you put a kid in front of something, 30 minutes of practice, and now they can do something that they thought was impossible 10 minutes ago that's what gets them, you know, addicted to this kind of thing. And there's that immediate uh, gratification of the hard work being rewarded instead of, you know, realizing it years and years later, once you're an adult. Yeah. I remember dreading the Mel Bay book and uh, oh, it was the worst dude <laughs> going through that, but it was my teacher who was really a rock guy. who just said, you know, this is how you do it. Show me how you do it. You heard how you, how you did it. It was, let's put this aside for men. This is, this is the scale right here. And by the way, here's a lick that's in your favorite Guns N' Roses song or whatever it is. That's when it all connected. It wasn't reading the Mel Bay book initially. Um, have any of you seen who have worked with, have you seen kids who have gone on the game, played the game, and then sat down in front of a piano or picked up another instrument and have seen that transition of what they've learned into the game into a real life instrument? Yeah, I have. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yes. Yes, we we I, we've seen uh, videos of students um, uh, in our testing uh, study groups, and we'd see the video of the the child playing the song in the game, and then get up, walk over to a piano, and play the same song. Um, because you're dealing with oral retention uh, and recall, uh, memorization becomes really developed uh, in this particular pathway. Um, we also have this is something that you know we're still in kind of the the beta phase of the game. But one thing that we're going to start to open up is to have some visual cues uh, so that students can go to an actual piano or keyboard and see it translate where they still get the finger numbers kind of like uh, the, the finger numbers in this game is kind of like a tab for piano. So it gives them a limited amount of information on how the song goes. The rest of that information gets contributed by the student based on how they heard the song. Uh, whether it's rhythmic information, melodic or harmonic. And so um, and that's basically the methodology in a nutshell is to get them to full fluency, they start to develop these different areas uh, orally and they understand how it all works. And that's how they, you get someone to be able to play anything instantly. Um, so we do, we do see that quite a bit, but we're gonna, we're gonna be working the game in 2.0 and 3.0 to make sure that we give this full runway of development so we see a lot more of that. Makes sense. We have a couple more questions here that I'd love to get answered. Um, Lisa says, thanks for this amazing form. I teach a hundred percent special needs adults. We are just starting to try out keys and kingdoms. I'm excited to see the outcome. We also use beams and spectrums with much success. 
are there any new music games, apes, or programs coming in the near future that would be accessible in the special needs population? Well, I can't speak of any of the other games that are out there being developed, but I can say to, to Lisa that we are looking at uh, other ways to reach uh, a wider spectrum of learners. And so, for example, this thing right here is um, from a company. Um, it's called the Orba, and it's a, it's a circular MIDI controller. And so you can see the scale notes are actually in a circle like this. And why that's so important is that if someone has some, some kind of neuromuscular disease and they can't extend their fingers, this they can use to actually play. And so these are the kind of breakthroughs that we are, we'd love to test out and to get implemented into the game to open up to more users. Um, another thing that we're gonna be looking at is integrating technology for visually um, impaired. So if you have you know, sight issues, um, then maybe we can actually have the game tell you the notes, you hear the notes that are coming in and then you, you play them. So things like that, we, we definitely, we, we want to bring it all in. So we're not trying to, we don't want to leave out any category of learners. We think music is for everybody. Another good question here. I teach music in my school as an after school enrichment subject. I pack in and pack out and don't have a regular classroom. What will I need to do to get this up and running? Portable keyboards for students. And then what? Laptops or iPads for each student? Question mark. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question because it depends on how many stations you want to set up. Um, it also depends on whether or not the, the kids that are there have devices that they could use if they're older. Um, you know, we'd have to, what I'd love to do is have a discussion um, with that person about what their needs are. Um, pack in, pack out could be pretty easy. These things are, are pretty small and light. Like, the, you know, so you could put, you know, six of these in a little carrying case and be fine. Um, so that could, that, that could definitely work. I think after school would be a great place for a game like this too. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, Brian, how did Guitar Hero take off and get so much traction? Were the kids talking about it amongst themselves? Was it kid? Would would kids see other kids playing it and want to pick it up and play the game? Is that what made it contagious? What were the elements that made it catch like wildfire? Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a definitely you know peer influenced. Um, it was you know parents influenced because the parents really wanted their their kids to sort of participate in the music that they do and love. Um, we also uh, had a college program, um, which, uh, which was wildly successful. So we would have Guitar Hero Nights at, uh, at bars and you know, at, uh, at, at uh, sorority and, and, and fraternities. Um, and that started catching on in a big, big way. We would sponsor them, we'd give out prizes for them. Um, and so that, would, that got a lot of notoriety. And then you know, once you start becoming part of pop culture, you, know, you end up on the family guy and you know all these other shows and you become you know a, a conversation piece uh with with you know uh, late night hosts and things like that um so it, it really became uh super popular and the thing that was uh was very interesting too is um uh professional athletes um in social media um uh, professional athletes as it turns out you know um you know play football uh and then they have a lot of free time or artists have you know have a lot of free time uh, meaning uh, music artists have a lot of free time at night if they actually a lot, of, uh, a lot of music artists are video game people. They, they play a lot of video games because they're on the road and it's something they can do uh, and connect with their friends and stuff, you know, wherever they are in the world. And, um, and so, you know, social media, as it began, began to kind of crank up in the late 2000s, sort of the, the campaigns that we ran, sort of turning, uh, you know, more towards social media versus mainstream media. Um, you know, one time we were, you know, we were running ads for $4 million on the Super Bowl. We were you know, we were uh, wrapping buildings and we were doing really crazy stuff on TV, uh, you know, hiring uh, Tom Cruise and uh, hiring Kobe Bryant, you know, and, and, you know, all kinds of people that to, to sort of, uh, you know, be our spokespiece people for it. And then um, what also helped a lot, a lot too is taking, so is getting behind a couple of artists. So we had, you might remember in the very beginning, we had Slash um, uh, from Guns N' Roses on the, on the, uh, on the cover. We also enrolled, um, we also enrolled um, uh, uh, Ozzy Osbourne as well. We had Soundgarden. We did special, actual, you know, just band uh, editions. So we did a Metallica. We did a Soundgarden one. Um, so there was uh, there was that too. So th there was just like we were hitting it from the artist end. We were, and the monetization was so good for the artists that they were, you know, all over it. Um, and this notion of expansion and halo of taking it just from playing the game in your in your house to 
translating it into buying music and translating that into um, into monetization in uh, live events was just a great ecosystem that just started cranking up and it just had a flywheel on it. Um, so it, so from that standpoint, demonization drove a lot of that demand and talk value. Social media did the same. And then peer pressure and peer influence of younger people and then college campuses. I could totally picture an after school a Keys and Kingdoms competition game, you know, scheduling a meetup for kids to play this. Also, I remember that Tom Cruise commercial which it was, there was a risky business guitar right. hero commercial. That was, that was epic. Uh, Jason, any uh, stories to share from your classroom or any moments of kids using this and seeing how they respond and react to the game and the program? My kids absolutely love it. They love the characters. They especially love that huge dog because <laughs> kids love animals. Um, no, this, the competitive nature is, is a huge draw to getting kids to to engage with it they do like to see how the others are doing and to rank themselves against them so that's a huge draw for them to continue playing the game they've they've been absolutely loving it so far i'm i'm excited to when i'm gonna i'm gonna start having like one day a week where we just get a half hour where since i i have the luxury of a computer lab i'm just gonna have a whole period played at once soon right now i just have a few stations up but i'm, I'm working to getting it installed on everything so are you teaching basic concepts essentially around like early music theory? And then are they, are you sort of rotating kids in and out of the game? And then, you know, eventually you want where everyone's on the game, but like, how's your curriculum work and how's the game fit into it? My curriculum's a little strange because it's also multimedia. I'm also teaching like um, animation and video editing. Uh, but during the music segments, uh, I am teaching them basic music, uh, like sight reading and things like that. And I was looking for, a good way to do more aural skills, which I love that this game actually has them when when the enemies are attacking, how it, it, it you have to like listen to it and kind of guess the notes like that you think the notes are and it helps with the defense. Um, it It's really been bolstering it. Very cool, very cool. If I we could add one thing yeah. to Jason, Zach, sorry. Um, he showed us his, his lab setup in san diego and i am just floored by what he was able to put together tirelessly working to set this thing up getting grant money to fund it he's got like 20 i don't know 20 so you can tell jason how many you have but like 28 stations of mac computers and midi controllers and it's just a beautiful looking room so i just wanted to say uh congrats to jason for for putting that together well, thank you so much. And, and by the way, thank you so much for being such an advocate for teachers and giving and, and giving us the tools to play the game and the game for for free up to 50 kids. It has been it is wonderful. And I'm, I'm so exciting to utilize it more on my curriculum. Well, it, we are honored and humbled. And uh, we're this is our mission in life. So we're going to keep doing it. Thank you. Well, we are running out of time slowly. But another question from Chris, and I think Graham had answered this. Does this program help with sight reading and notation? So currently there's no staff or notes in the game. Um, and I think as we develop, I think there's going to be room for something like that. Um, we wanted to tap into a quick, organic, intuitive way for kids to get that instant gratification. Um, some of the, the core tenets of our company is that everyone's born with music. We're all born with a musical instrument, which is amazing in itself. And we all have a deep reservoir of musical experience because we're exposed to music every day. And so what the game does instantly is gets you into that comfortable medium and that comfortable modality of oral learning and, and gets like what, uh, what um, Beth would, was saying earlier, it's a gateway into music learning. Once they get that, they capture that fire and that passion for learning, they're, they're a lot more uh, probably open to going in other directions, whether that's back into sight reading or more traditionally orchestra or band. Um, we just want to get the get the kids that, especially the kids that don't think that they're musical, or don't think that they can play an instrument. Get them into this game, get them playing, and then they can go in all different directions. So I think that to answer your question, I think it'll probably be coming down the pipeline. I think uh, once we once we see the initial uh, attraction um, and the consistency of the students playing the game, I think there's definitely going to be a need because, like I said earlier, we think sight reading is a very valuable skill to have. Um, in so many settings, especially in a group setting. So I think it's, it's definitely going to be coming. Yeah, I remember playing violin and saxophone in the school band, dreading it, 
putting it off, not long to learn how to read the music. And then I picked up guitar. My guitar teacher taught me Jimi Hendrix, taught me Led Zeppelin, ACDC. That kind of lit my fire. And then I said, sight reading sucks. But if I want to make it go as a musician, I have to put the time in. At that point, my motivation was I was in a different mindset to really double down and focus on spend the time on it once it got me. And I feel like something like this, something that could bring kids in, get them excited, and then they can go off and double down and focus on things that are, you know, that might be important to them as well. Uh, question from Jules here. Hopefully not a vibe killer question. Is the low latency of 5G cellular that might allow live online play along, play together collaboration, something that music education tech peeps are keeping an eye on planning to harness in the future. Is there a collaboration element with Keys and Kingdoms? For a Build? multiplayer platform? For a uh, multiplayer platform? We are, we are, that is definitely one of our huge milestones. It's very expensive to build multiplayer. Um, what we're going to be doing, though, we're, we are stewards of these kids on this game. And so we have to be safety and security is number one above all else, even above education and safety and security. And so um, it's a closed circuit game right now. No one can get you know into that game unless you are a subscriber and you're a player. And then when we expand out to multiplayer, because just imagine what that's going to look like with this game. Now you and your friends can go into a dungeon and battle a tough enemy. And what that really equates to is a really intense band rehearsal. Um, that is going to be so much fun and so engaging. But we have to be very, very careful um, because we also know that if you're too open in the social world, then there's a, you know, that opens up to some bad stuff. And so um, as we develop multiplayer, and it will be coming, um, we're going to be extra, extra um, protective of these kids and make sure that security and safety is number one in the development. I think uh, just a, one, one comment on that too. Um, uh, I think that uh, it's a very, very critical element to the game. Uh, you know, we, we know this is the way people play today. Um, you know, all of the largest games in the world and, and, the, and the highest level of engagement uh, for all games is multiplayer games. And, you know, you can imagine, you know, the creative play and create music and being able to sort of peacock around with your friend group um, is got, you know, a high level of engagement and, and thus a high level of satisfaction and, and replayability. So, you know, that I think is the, is the you know, uh, to be to be pithy here, that that is the key to our kingdom is to is to drive uh, hard towards uh, retention um, and replayability and and music creation, and that's going to make it a lot more fun. Totally makes sense. Okay, we've got a couple things to plug just in our last final minutes. First of all, Beth from the Give a Note Foundation, which is an amazing organization that helps with grants and donations and just all around music education with schools and students. Beth, what's the best way for people to learn more or possibly get involved or, you know, how they take advantage of Give a Note? Yeah. So um, Give a Note's focused on innovation. We've got a new program coming out called Music Technology Empowers. Uh, it'll be a new grant program this spring uh, founded in with our funding partners, Keys and Kingdoms and Soundtrap EDU. So uh, they were our initial found, uh, funders into that program. Uh, it is not going to be an open and application um, process, but we are always happy to hear from teachers and interact with uh, and hear your stories and, and, and learn what your needs are. So don't ever hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us at info at giveanote.org at any time. And I can assure you that every email gets responded to. So we'd love to hear from you. Info at givenote.org. And Graham, you've made a big promise here, which is free games. I think people might be taking advantage of this for the best. How do people reach out, get their game, get this into the classroom? What's the best way for them to get involved and figure it yeah, all out? Absolutely. Um, the best way is to go to our website, keysandkingdoms.com, and then uh, just find the educator uh, enrollment form on there um, and fill out the form. We'll get that and we'll get right back to you. Awesome. We have two minutes left to bring us to the hour. Has anything been unsaid? Anyone else want to jump in and mention anything before we wrap up? Um, I do want to actually do a quick introduction to Kartik and Chris, who are team members. Uh, Kartik is an amazing, amazing uh, person and team member. He's the audio director. Um, he's done an amazing job with our music. Um, obviously a critical part of the game. Uh, Chris is our uh, education account manager. Um, and he has been um, just a, an amazing uh, connection for the teachers, um, very responsive, um, helps them through any of their issues if, um, if, you know, if we, don't, if we can't get to them right away. 
So um, I'd like to give, uh, if we could type Chris's email uh, into the chat box. If, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to him directly. Um, if you're not quite sure where to go or where the enrollment form is, um, Chris can certainly uh, direct you in, in, that, in that field. If Chris wants to type his email, I am right here. Chris.halt at team keys and kingdoms.com. Team dot keys and kingdoms.com. Yeah. Team dot. And can we also add the web link in chat for the form? Yeah. That way teachers yeah. can go directly to that. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see if I can put that in there yeah. for sure. All right. Graham, you got that? Yeah, putting it in there now. Let's see. Your computer's well, probably faster than mine. <laughs> there you go. Did everyone get that? That's the that's the uh, enrollment form in the chat. Well, while we're getting that in there, just want to say thank you to everyone for tuning in on a Saturday to talk about music education, music tech, keys and kingdoms. A very cool thing. I actually Graham is sending me a a version of this game because I'm very excited to just check it out and 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 get involved. I've played on my phone and it was very interactive and immediately got me playing music and hitting notes and ear training. And I was testing my Berkeley education to see how good of ear training I received in college. And I actually, I did okay. I did pretty good, but it put me to the test for sure. Um, such a cool game. I, you know, music, I, for me personally, music education was such a struggle. I worked so hard. And I, it's always hard no matter how you do it, but I think a game like this would have been so engaging, so fun, um, and you know, might have been a lot less stress and a lot less. Uh, I, had, I had some pretty mean teachers early on, so this might have helped with that. Um, thanks for everyone tuning in. Anything else uh, in our last moment, Graham? Anything to wrap it up, or have we said it all? Just a, a huge thanks to our panelists today for taking the time out. Um, we just we can't be where we're, where we're at or where we're going without you. Um, Huge thanks to our audience, all our attendees. Um, thank you so much for being here for the hour on a Saturday. And we look forward to doing this again. And, you know, please feel free to contact us. Let us know some key topics that we can bring to the forefront. And, again, we're just – anything we can do to help support you in the classroom or at home, um, that is our mission. So don't be shy and be sure to reach out to us. Fantastic. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see everyone next time. Thank you, Zach. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Thank you Thanks, Zach. Guys. You did great. Thank you, buddy. Happy Take Saturday. Care,